Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to uh, ITIF event on uh, the case for a national manufacturing strategy. I'm Rob Atkinson. I'm president of ITIF, and uh, we're releasing a report today with that title in which we will walk you through what our main findings are. This is part of an overall series that ITIF is doing on manufacturing. Uh, the first report is being released today. The second report will be released in June, which is a, a look across the world at what are, what are other countries doing with regard to manufacturing strategies, particularly around technology. And the third report will be released uh, ideally in September on looking at what, are, what kinds of things that we should be doing, uh, which we'll allude to a little bit today, but go into more detail then. I was talking with someone recently uh, who had said, oh, I saw you're doing a manufacturing uh, report, manufacturing event. Uh, uh, that's really great. I was a little bit surprised. I thought you guys were all about innovation. <laughs> and I thought, well, I don't know if, what's, if that's a comment on us or that's a comment on, on uh, what we think of manufacturing. It's like, we actually think manufacturing is about innovation, uh, which is why we're doing this work. So... Um, uh, what we'll do today is uh, Stephen and I will walk through the report, and then we have three great respondents who will comment on the report and provide other thoughts, and we'll adjourn precisely at 10.30. We should have plenty of time for questions, so I'm just going to go down the, the, the list here and introduce them. Uh, that's my colleague Stephen Azell, most of you know, is a senior analyst here at, at ITIF. Uh, Mark Rice is the president of Marine Applied Physics Corporation, uh, he, uh, which is a, a manufacturing company here in Maryland. Uh, after working for several engineering firms in the U.S. government laboratories, he formed uh, Marine Applied Physics Corporation in 1986. Uh, MAC has uh, both R&D and production offices in Maryland, Virginia, and Maine, and it currently designs and manufactures electromechanical systems that range from submarine and surface ship components to commercial motion control systems. I'm not going to read all of Mark's bio. Uh, he has a BA in physics from the University of Maine and is a licensed professional engineer. We're really pleased that Ro Kahana can join us today. Ro is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Domestic Operations at the International Trade Administration. Uh, he was appointed to that position by President Obama. Uh, and uh, the U.S. Foreign and Commercial Service is a key part of the, uh, is the key export promotion agency. And in this capacity, uh, Roe is responsible for over overseeing the domestic operations of 109 U.S. export assistance centers operating in 48 states. And he's playing an instrumental role in, in implementing the president's commitment, uh, goal of uh, doubling exports over the next five years. Uh, he's also responsible for a number of trade promotion programs, the Trade Information Center, and has also been involved in planning and executing a number of export missions, including to countries such as India, Brazil, China, and Mexico. And he is a, uh, uh, prior to joining the Department of Commerce, he was a counsel at O'Melney and Myers, where he practiced intellectual property law. And he has a, um, he was Phi Beta graduate at University of Chicago in economics and has a Yale Law degree. And last is uh, Eric Newhouse, who is the Senior Vice President for National Association of Manufacturers. Uh, Eric was the, um, uh, in addition to serving as NAM's lead government uh, relations staff member, he's responsible for development and implementation of NAM's broad policy agenda. He joined NAM in 2007. He had 11 years service on the Hill. Began his career with Senator Mike DeWine from Ohio. Uh, also worked with uh, Congressman Mike Oxley, of, also of Ohio, and then joined the staff of George Voinovich, Senator Voinovich, in 1999, and became chief of staff. And he holds a master's degree in international affairs from George Washington University. So let me start by. Can we turn those front lights on or not? Everybody see that? Okay. Is that the, yeah? Okay. So we're going to do two, four things today. Uh, what, where are we in terms of manufacturing? Why is manufacturing important? Why do we need a strategy? And what are the outlines of such a strategy? So this is really the story you hear in Washington today. When you talk to pundits, when you listen to most economists, when you talk to policymakers, they will essentially say, what's going on in US manufacturing is really what's been going on in agriculture. It's essentially, we, we went from an economy with 60% farm jobs a decade ago, a year, a century ago, 
uh, down to about 3% now, but it didn't mean because we're producing less food, it's just because we're incredibly productive of the world's most productive agricultural system, and that's a success. This is what we hear about manufacturing. We've lost over 6 million manufacturing jobs in the last decade, and yet what we're told largely is this is a success story. This is all about productivity. And let me suggest that maybe this is too strong a way to frame it, but in our view, it's not all about productivity. It's also about declining U.S. competitiveness for manufacturing establishments to thrive and grow in the United States. So that's a very, very different uh, analysis, and it leads to a set of very, very different uh, policy recommendations. If you don't think there's a problem, if this is all about productivity, there's really not a lot we should be doing. It's just really about helping workers who are losing their jobs by being in incredibly productive firms. If it's a little bit more about la uh, output decline and lack of international competitiveness, then it suggests we need to do more. <coughs> So this is uh, essentially what the story is. From 2000 to 2009, real manufacturing output, so these, all of these numbers are going to be inflation adjusted. Real manufacturing output went up 5%. GDP went up 15%. So just right there, that suggests that manufacturing is losing share. It's not keeping up with where, how the overall economy is growing. So again, leaving aside jobs. This is just about real output by, U by firms in the U.S. who are doing manufacturing. But the other part of this story is if you look at the 19 major manufacturing categories that the Bureau of Economic Analysis tracks, and you look at real output, 15 of those 19 sectors are producing less in 2009 than they were in 2000. And those make up 79 percent of U.S. output. So essentially four-fifths of the U.S. manufacturing economy is producing less today than they were a decade ago. Now what's, why is that number up, that 5%? I would argue that number is up because we mismeasure two big sectors in manufacturing. And we mismeasure them not by a little bit, by a lot. The first one is petroleum and coal products. The second is electronics and computers. So let me talk about petroleum and coal. According to BEA, uh, the real output of that industry, in other words, coal manufacturing, so the processing of coal, and oil refining, those are the two principal segments, went up 73%. Now, if you go and you look at the Energy Information Agency in the Department of Energy, what they will tell you is that oil uh, refinery production went up 3%. Coal production went down, natural gas production was stable. That's not essentially a story of that industry going up. Why is that number there? It's because the prices went up so radically, dramatically fast in that sector that they were, BEA is confusing price increases with output increases. So that's that sector. What about the other one, computers and electronic products? That is essentially a story of uh, it's a confusing story, actually. There's a number of economists now, and particularly Susan Hausman at, at the Upjohn Institute in Michigan, uh, and Dan Luria at the, at the Manufacturing Technology Center in Michigan, who both essentially, and us, have all said, we think that number is significantly overinflated. There's different stories. One of the stories is that in, import prices are essentially undercounted, and therefore uh, what looks like its output in the U.S. is actually imports. There's other stories about it being... Uh, not, not correctly uh, accounting for improvements in quality and productivity. But the bottom line is, we think those two sectors are significantly overstated, and you'll see why. This is what the story, as I said before, Our economists look at that number, this is real manufacturing output as a share of GDP, and they say everything's fine. This is not a story of decline, a little bit of dip here at the end, but this is a story of stability. Well, let's look at it a little more carefully. The green line is real output of what's called non-durables as a share of GDP. Non-durables are things like the chemical industry, uh, the petroleum industry, uh, paper, uh, clothing, apparel. Anything that's not last more than three years is called non-durables. You can see the story of non-durables. Essentially, starting in 94, 93, it's just continued to decline. 
Now here's the, here's the durable story. The durables are things like airplanes, cars, uh, computers, machine tools, uh, things lumber, things like that. And you, you can see there is that the story is just the opposite. Durables are going up. Okay, and you put those two together, and that's how you get that blue line on the top. But it's a little different. Now, if you just look at the computer sector, which, again, we think is significantly overinflated, here's what you see. You see the line, the orange line, the dotted orange line, is non-durables with the computer sector taken out. And it looks pretty much the same as durables, particularly after 2000. Uh, essentially a story of, of decline. And now you look at the overall number, and you see essentially the same thing. So our, our assertion is that we really fail to measure manufacturing output accurately, particularly in those two sectors. If you were to measure that accurately, assuming, for example, that oil and gas uh, refining and coal didn't go up at all, and that manufacturing only went up about 70%, what you, which is a huge number, by the way, given the fact that the, the jobs were lost almost by half in that sector. It's hard to imagine improvements in output by almost three times. Uh, what you find is that the actual output of U.S. manufacturing declined by 10% as a share of GDP. I think that's a more realistic number. It, just on a sort of field, field measure, it feels right. I actually think it is right from looking at all this, but it just is much more intuitive. We see this all the time. We see this in terms of the job loss numbers, et cetera. The recent numbers just came out, I think, Monday, maybe yesterday or the day last week, from the BLS on mass, on mass layoffs. And the good news is that the mass, mass layoffs in manufacturing are at an all-time low. The bad news is I think they're at an all-time low because there aren't that many mass layoffs to be had anymore. Uh, I'm not sure how we, you know, we've had so many mass layoffs, we don't have them anymore. The other evidence we would suggest for this is if it's a productivity story, productivity is pretty closely correlated with improvements and additions to capital stock. Companies become more productive when they add new machinery, new computers, new factories. That's how they become more productive. And yet, when you look at all of these sectors, what you see, again, looking in constant dollars, the peak year in which they had capital, so BEA adds up the amount of capital that every firm has, puts it all together. You put that all together in steel, uh, aluminum, whatever, all of the primary metals, their capital stock peaked in 1981. Uh, textiles peaked in 1997, wood products in 2000. So again, this suggests that many, many manufacturing sectors have just simply have less capital today. And again, the productivity story is not consistent with us with the story of companies and industries having less capital. Another way to look at this, this is overall percentage change in fixed assets. Same thing. How many fixed assets, computers, machine tools, big stampers, factories do is, 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 is our companies adding. And what you can see in the 60s, in the 70s, U.S. manufacturers or manufacturers in the U.S. were adding at a very rapid rate, about 60 percent additions to the capital stock every decade. Went down in the 80s, we all remember that decade, Rust Belt, etc. But it picked up back in the 90s. But again, in this last decade, the lowest improvement of capital stock that's ever been recorded, just a 6 percent increase overall. And again, I think some of that's overinflated. And again, this wasn't because the overall economy didn't invest in capital stock. What we really invested in, in capital stock was housing capital stock. But the other things we invested in were sports stadiums. So if you look at sports stadiums, they, uh, sports stadiums are in the blue, they doubled. So the amount of sports stadiums we have doubled between 2000 and 2008. And the amount of mutual fund capital stock, all the computers and everything, the mutual funds. So we were investing in this country. We just weren't investing in what you might say wealth production. All right, so Stephen's now going to talk a little bit about why we care about that. If we assert that there's a problem, why do we care? Okay, so our report 
makes the point that there are five key reasons why manufacturing is important to the U.S. economy. And the first reason is that we are going to have to have a robust manufacturing sector to close our trade deficit. If you look at the prior decade from 2000 to 2010, the numbers were astounding. The U.S. tallied a $5.5 trillion trade deficit in all goods, a $4.4 trillion deficit in manufactured products, and even in advanced technology products, those highest tech sectors of manufacturing like IT, optoelectronics, uh, aerospace, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, etc. we had a $427 billion trade deficit. So why is a trade deficit uh, important? Well, because ultimately a trade deficit represents a hidden tax on, on the next generation of Americans that will compromise their future well-being. Essentially, it represents the fact that they're going to have to, in the future, produce more than they consume and export the difference to pay off the trade deficit. So how are we going to pay off the trade deficit? Well, there are those that say we don't have to have manufacturing, that if we grow our services, exports, and our exports of non-manufactured goods like agriculture or natural gas, we'll be able to close the trade deficit. But the reality is that we're going to have to have a robust U.S. manufacturing sector to close the trade deficit because exports account for 50, uh, because manufacturing accounts for 57% of US exports. Uh, Howard Wheel at the Brookings Institution has done some research into this and has asked what kind of compound annual growth rate would we have to see in services, non-manufactured non uh, goods, and manufactured goods exports to close the trade deficit over the next decade. And essentially what he finds is shown on this chart. Um, which says that, look, if we were to rely on services alone to close the trade deficit over the next decade, services would have to grow at about 13.5%. Uh, but the reality is that they grew uh, at just uh, uh, about a 7% rate, uh, compound annual growth rate over the past decade. So we'd have to have a 70% increase in the annual growth rate of services exports to close the trade deficit we'd have to have an even larger increase in exports of non-manufactured goods. Uh, they'd have to about double from their 11% growth rate over the past decade. Uh, however, we can get there much more quickly by increasing our manufacturing exports. If we increase them by just 9.4% a year over the next decade, we can close the trade deficit. The compound annual growth rate of manufacturing exports over the past decade was 6%. Right, so only have to go about a 50% increase. There's a shorter road to hoe. We'll have to have manufacturing exports to close the trade deficit in the future. The second reason why manufacturing is important is because it is a key source of employment and good paying jobs for Americans. Um, the economic research pretty clearly shows that there are greater employment multipliers from manufacturing job creation than in most other sectors of the economy. This chart here looks at the uh, employment multiplier for a number of se sectors and what we find is that uh, most research shows that on average each manufacturing job created supports from two to five additional jobs throughout the rest of the economy. Those numbers are higher with durable goods manufacturing which has a multiplier of 3.7. Um, research from Germany shows that uh, in their modern smart manufacturing facilities that the employment multiplier is up to five. And when you look at the most high-tech sectors of the economy, like uh, computer electronics manufacturing, uh, they have a multiplier of about 16. So every one job created in the computer electronics manufacturing industry supports 15 additional jobs throughout the rest of the economy. The other reason why we need manufacturing jobs is because they pay higher wages. On average, they pay about 9% higher in wages and benefits than average jobs throughout the rest of the U.S. economy. One of the key reasons why manufacturing jobs pay more is because manufacturing jobs tend to support additional exports. Uh, many of these, man, most manufacturing uh, industries are traded sector uh, industries, and what you find is that uh, the export premium uh, results in about 18% higher compensation for U.S. manufacturing workers and that export earnings premium is about 20% higher for blue collar workers than for white collar workers. So manufacturing is a key source of high wage jobs for the US economy. Manufacturing also supports jobs for individuals at a number of skill levels. Now, to be sure, uh, manufacturing increasingly relies on highly skilled, highly educated members of the workforce, and that's very important, 
but also even today, 47% uh, of the individuals in the U.S. manufacturing workforce have not graduated from high school. So manufacturing is a key source of jobs for individuals across all skill levels of the U.S. economy. Third reason why manufacturing... If, if folks in the back want to sit, there's lots of seats up here, so feel free to line up. And also, if these slides will be on, on the website probably tomorrow, so you don't need to take free notes if you want. They'll refer to them later. And I think we'll actually have the, the slides up this morning, uh, probably by the end of the presentation. So the third reason why we see manufacturing as critical to the U.S. economy is because it is a principal source of an economy's R&D and uh, innovative activity in its firms. So. Uh, manufacturing accounts for 70% of a nation's R&D activity. And there is actually research from the National Science Foundation's Business Research and Development and Innovation Survey from 2008 that suggests that manufacturing firms actually constitute the most innovative types of firms in an economy. So what their report found was that um, across the entire U.S. economy, across all industries, 9% of U.S. firms reported being active product or process innovators between 2006 and 2008. For services firms, that average was 8%. But for manufacturing firms, 22% uh, on average reported being active innovators. And when you look at specific manufacturing sectors, like pharmaceuticals and computer and electronics, you find some of the highest rates of any activity for any industries in the United States, with 42% of pharmaceuticals and computer and electronics firms reporting being active innovators. So manufacturing a sector is a key driver of R&D activity and innovation throughout the US economy. The fourth reason why we see manufacturing as vitally important is because fundamentally manufacturing and services are inseparable and complementary components of an economy. The reality is that manufacturing, R&D, and innovation go hand in hand. Look, we've told ourselves a story over the past two decades that the U.S. can let go of its manufacturing industries because it will be able to seamlessly and effortlessly migrate up the value chain to higher value-added sectors of economic activity, uh, including a lot of services activities like R&D, design, financing, service of products, etc. Um, but the reality uh, is that you cannot draw a sharp line that separates the R&D and the manufacturing of a technology-based product. Uh, they go hand in hand. Um, and you see that pretty clearly um, when you look at the fact, uh, for example, that 90% um, of all electronics R&D now takes place in Asia. Uh, because what's happening is that as manufacturing has been pulled offshore, now the R&D is being pulled behind it. And this actually in part explains why from 1987 to 2008, um, uh, R&D by U.S. corporations grew 2.65 times faster abroad than did all corporate investment in the United States uh, domestically. So uh, our corporate R&D uh, is increasingly moving offshore at a higher rate. Um, the second reason why manufacturing and services uh, are inseparable and complementary is fundamentally that the health of one sector relies upon the health of the other. The report mentions an anecdote from an encounter we had with the head of a leading Washington, D.C. economic policy think tank who was asked, really, how much manufacturing could the United States lose and still be okay? And the gentleman replied, really? Really, we could lose all of it and be fine. But that's just not the case. Because when you look at key services sectors, let's take express delivery, for example, we find that 50%, at least, and up to 60% by some estimates, of the client base for the services-based express delivery sector in the United States, FedEx and UPS, they rely on manufacturing clients as the key source of their client base. And you can look at any number of, of services type jobs, whether it's accounting, consulting, legal, transportation, wholesale and retail trade, express delivery, a number of their clients come from the manufacturing industries. If we don't have a healthy manufacturing industry, we're not going to be able to support those services sector jobs. At the same time, it goes in the other direction. And in fact, research from Korea shows that um, some of the weakness in the manufacturing sector of their economy can be attributed to the fact that they have very low rates of productivity in their services sector. So their inability uh, uh, to deliver professional business services is impacting their ability to have world-leading manufacturers. So the health of the two sectors go hand in hand. Manufacturing and services are inseparable and complementary. We must have both in our economy. 
The final reason why we see manufacturing as vital to the United States is because it is critically important to our national security. Listen, if we want to have a, a national defense that remains on the technological cutting edge, we're going to have to have some of the most sophisticated manufacturing in the world going on in the United States. Um, but what we see, unfortunately, is that increasingly as our manufacturing base moves offshore, so does our defense industrial base. And what we're seeing is that um, in a number of defense critical technologies, our domestic sourcing is endangered, uh, including in technologies and platforms like advanced batteries, uh, photovoltaics, space qualified electronics, hard disk drives, and LCD systems. Um, as we rely more on a global uh, supply base for the defense industry, uh, supply chains get stretched in time of national emergency, uh, we may not be able to manufacture what we need here. Um, another problem, uh, as this Business Week article, Dangerous Fakes, pointed out, uh, that as we increasingly rely on foreign producers of manufactured products, we become increasingly vulnerable to fakes and counterfeit goods. In fact, between 2005 and 2008, the Defense Department reports that there was a 142% increase in occasions of counterfeit products getting into the DOD supply chain. And Robert Ernst, who runs the Naval Systems Command at Patuxent, uh, says that uh, across virtually every major weapons platform system the U.S. has, we have encountered field failures uh, in the past few wars as a result of counterfeit parts. The final reason why, on this point, that manufacturing is vital for U.S. national security is that, look, a robust manufacturing sector is critical to a healthy U.S. economy which gives us the ability to have the latitude and the freedom of movement we want in geopolitics. Uh, when we have uh, a country in which we're indebted to, to the tune of $2.85 trillion in foreign currency reserves, that's going to, by definition, constrain our freedom of movement in international relations and geopolitics. Manufacturing is key to a health economy that gives us the ability to fund a world-leading national defense system. Okay, so those are the five reasons why we see manufacturing as critically important to the U.S. economy. So, why then do we need a national manufacturing strategy beyond the fact that manufacturing is very important? Um, well, simply put, the first reason is that other countries have national manufacturing strategies that supports uh, their manufacturing industries to keep them on the world's technological frontier. Uh, that's just the cover page there of, the, uh, of, of Germany's high-tech strategy, uh, excellent 150-page report that d uh, lays out all the policies that the German government has put in place to support their manufacturers, large and small alike. Uh, on the right-hand side there is just an extract from uh, Japan's 2006 Science and Technology Basic Plan, which speaks <coughs> to how that country supports their manufacturers. And I don't know if you can read it there, but goal number seven, which is circled uh, uh, proclaims that Japan uh, should become the world's top manufacturing nation. So they have an unabashedly and explicitly stated goal uh, that Japan will lead the world in manufacturing and their policies drive through that conclusion. Um, a key way that strategies like this work is that they identify critical technology platforms which they uh, want to target and which they want to kind of uh, uh, align the scarce resources of society behind. So let's take a look at how these countries support advanced battery technology, for example. Well, Japan has said that advanced batteries are, quote, an issue of national survival. And the country has committed to investing $275 million between 2000 and 2012 to support advanced battery manufacturing development of Japanese manufacturers. Germany has done the same thing. Uh, in fact, Germany has committed um, $1.1 billion over the next five years to uh, uh, advanced battery construction, lightweight vehicle construction, and other advanced uh, kind of automotive electronic components. And even China has said uh, in its Innovation 2020 strategy that by 2015, it wants to lead the world in advanced battery manufacturing. Uh, it'll put $1.5 trillion into seven sectors over the next decade uh, to keep them at the technological forefront. Uh, in the meantime, the United States tells its companies, well, you need to go out and compete as independent actors in a global marketplace unsupported by uh, kind of a specific R&D program. Uh, so we're asking 
Ford and GM uh, to go out by themselves and develop advanced battery manufacturing uh, while they're going up against companies in international marketplaces that are fully supported by the technology ecosystems of their nations to have them at the technological edge. And uh, that's a problem. Um, final two reasons why uh, we need a manufacturing strategy. Uh, first, because systemic market failures um, uh, affect manufacturing activity. Uh, we see this in two ways. Uh, first, uh, the reality is that uh, companies are not able to capture all the benefits of their own investments. Um, in fact, the rate of return to society from corporate R&D uh, is twice the estimated returns that the company itself receives. Uh, so that's why we need policies like the R&D tax credit and the knowledge workforce credit uh, to encourage companies to uh, create more innovation uh, than they would. They, they innovate to societally suboptimal levels. Um, and secondly, because um, uh, a number of market failures plague the diffusion and adoption of cutting edge technologies and best practices. This is why a number of nations, uh, including the UK, Argentina, Spain, Canada, uh, the United States, have specific programs designed to support their small to medium enterprise manufacturer in uh, technology adoption and best practices adoption. Um, unfortunately, however, these countries spend substantially more than the United States does, for example, as a share of GDP, Japan spends 54 times more on their Kosasuchi centers to support their SME manufacturers than the United States does. Um, the UK, the United Kingdom, through their technology strategy board, uh, spends 20 times more as a share of GDP uh, than the US does in supporting its small to medium enterprise manufacturers. So we have to rectify that. Um, and then last point, um, you know, ultimately, uh, if we lose uh, key industries in our economy, uh, it's unlikely that we'll ever be able to get them back. If we were to lose Boeing, for example, through a combination of foreign mercantilist practices, um, it would be unlikely that even a steep decline in the dollar uh, would be able to kind of recreate that industry within the United States. Uh, ultimately, you know, intangible knowledge-based capital uh, doesn't uh, flow easily, so you just wouldn't be able to re recreate uh, the firm from scratch, the complex web of suppliers, uh, the professional associations that would be needed to support these industries. Um, so. Uh, it's critically important that we get serious about a national manufacturing strategy to support our U.S. manufacturers. Thank you. So, when you look at that product, uh, the 787, which I'm really desperate to fly on, I think I'm going to go to Japan just so I can fly on one. Cause, uh, is, is ANA or Japan Air the first, going to be the first one to fly it? Um, that's an incredibly complex thing to make. No one, no other country in the world can make that right now. Uh, and as Stephen said, if we if we lose the capability of that through things like unfair launching that the Europeans are engaged in or Chinese unfair trade practices, it's going to be hard to resurrect that. And and so that's really a key pointer. Is this is not these are not T-shirt factories. These are not call centers. That if you lose them, you can get them back a couple of weeks later. I think you know. I think I could probably create a call center on my own in a week. I mean, I'm sure it's more complex than that, but it's not all that complex. Building that or figuring out how to make semiconductors, or how to design and build automobiles. Those are, those are hard things to do. So when you look at all this, one of the first things that comes up is, well, look, we don't really need to do anything anyway, because look, I, yeah, OK, we'll grant you that point that manufacturing is declining here. But it's declining everywhere, right? There are people who say this. Well, I won't say who, but there are. The reality is that's simply wrong. As a share of GDP, manufacturing is only declining in about four or five countries. Unfortunately, we're one of them. The UK, Spain, and Italy are the print. So I don't really want to benchmark the US economy against Spain, Italy, and the UK. No offense to my friends from those countries. You look at countries like Germany and Japan, manufacturing is stable. You look at countries like Sweden, Austria, Austria Korea, manufacturing is actually growing. So most countries in the world manufacturing is a share. Even China, where there's been, a, I think, a very, very misleading report a few years ago that said, look, manufacturing is declining in China. Manufacturing, China added more manufacturing jobs in four years than we have as an overall number of manufacturing jobs. That's not decline. Manufacturing is growing. So the fact is we need to do something. And in fact, we are certainly doing something. Uh, the administration has a number of initiatives, which, which Roe will talk about. The, Obama, the President Obama's commitment to double exports, uh, the president's budget, and the national innovation strategy has a number of key components, including increasing the MEP funding, including new technology initiatives at places like NIST and DOE. Uh, and these are all important. Uh, proposals on a bipartisan basis to increase the R&D tax credit. But we've got to do more. 
we've, this is a too serious a problem, too big a challenge. And we're not gonna, we're not gonna lay out exactly what we need to do, but first thing we need to do is we need to, what we say, look out for number six. <laughs> you don't really get that joke until you've both seen the other, which we haven't done. The U.S. ranks six out of, uh, in a study we did of 40 countries on innovation-based competitiveness. Uh, we're not number one anymore. The reason we're number six is we, let, we rank 40th overall of 40 countries in the rate of change. The rate of change in things like the amount of corporate R&D, the amount of government R&D, the number of scientists and engineers, the role growth of productivity. So we need to start looking out for number six. We need to defend U.S. interests much more aggressively, economic interests. And then really what we've got to do is we talk about the four T's. We've got to get those right. I'm not going to go through all the deals, but tech is one thing. We don't invest enough in government support of R&D. Stephen talked about the fact that most other countries are significantly investing in manufacturing technology R&D. They're significantly investing in assistance for small and mid-sized manufacturers. We're doing some of that, but we need to do more. Talent, we've always talked about that. We need to do a much better job of training workers, both at the high level, if you will, on STEM education, science, technology, engineering, math, but also at the technician level, we're not doing enough there. Trade, we have got to do a better job, not just of market opening, but of, of market enforcement. We don't do anywhere near enough of challenging what we call systemic mercantilists, China, Brazil. Uh, you look at the recent WTO case on, on Airbus, I mean, WTO seems to be incapable of giving one country a hard time. Well, if we're going to give Europe a hard time, we have to give the U.S. a hard time. Isn't that fair? The reality is when you look at those, that, that WTO case where well, there was about, uh, I'm going to get this slightly wrong, but $18 billion in launch aid uh, for the Europeans, just flat out subsidy to put airframes in the marketplace. The U.S. subsidy was R&D support. Come on. So what we've, we've got to do a much better job of fighting unfair foreign trade practices that are specifically targeted at undermining U.S. manufacturing competitiveness, whether it's IP theft, standards manipulation to keep foreign U.S. products out of their marketplaces, currency, and a whole set of other things. And lastly, tax. In our view, this is really has to be a bipartisan or nonpartisan effort. You know, if you sort of to make broad generalizations, the Democrats like tech and the Republicans like tax. <coughs> Uh, obviously, that's a broad, broad generalization, but we have to do both. We have to increase public investment in technology and innovation and science and, and a skilled workforce, but we also have to do more on the tax side. You look at what other countries have done, we're now 23rd in the world in the, in the generosity of our research and development tax credit. Other countries have decided they're going to win by putting in place a much stronger R&D tax credit. The Canadians are three times more than we are. The Mexicans are higher. The Chinese are higher. The French are higher. Everybody's higher. Uh, but not just there. If you look at incentives for investing in new capital equipment and new factories, other countries are much better. If you just look at the overall corporate tax rate, we're now the highest in the world in effective tax rate, not just statutory. So we really have to have a comprehensive strategy that does all of that. We're not going to lay that out in detail today, but just to lay that as a predicate, if we're going to resolve this problem, we have to do that. Last point, we have to have an overall strategy behind that. Now, the administration has been charged by Congress in the Competes Act to create a national innovation and competitive strategy. The Department of Commerce is taking the lead on that. They have until January 2nd or 3rd, I believe, of 2012 to deliver that strategy. I encourage you all to follow that and, and, and provide input to that process. I'm, I'm optimistic that that process will help us figure these questions out and move the ball down the field. Uh, and then the last point I'll make is, you know, in a lot of ways what we're trying to do in some ways is, 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 is sound the alarm bell. Uh, but we are not at all at least feeling defeatist. We don't feel like somehow we've passed the turning point and this is in, incapable of being uh, turned around. I think probably the UK is in that boat. And it's really going to be hard for the UK to really regain a robust manufacturing sector because they lost most of theirs in the 70s and 80s. We haven't. Uh, but our view is if we don't take action in the next few years and really turn this around, which we can, uh, we're going to find it, us at a tipping point where the UK has been and then it becomes very, very difficult to turn this around. But we think with the right policies, we've got great manufacturers, uh, we've got a great skilled workforce, if we take the right policies to help that, uh, we can turn this around. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Mark, and you're welcome to do it from there. Or okay. here. I'll uh, stay seated here. Uh, let's, yeah. Uh, we turned on here. 
Uh, I, I found this to be an extremely important report. So I've been manufacturing for about 30 years off and on. And there's this lack of a national strategy is, is evident every day in the, in the companies I deal with and in the infrastructure. I've had the advantage of being overseas in South Korea and some of the European countries. And what I found in South Korea was an extremely cohesive approach to manufacturing. We were in the Hyundai shipyard, the largest shipyard in the world that produces 70 major ships a year. We don't produce two major ships a year except for the military. And the degree of corporate organization, of value chain relationships, of government support is extraordinary. And there's nothing like that in any sector other than perhaps the military in the United States. So the degree to which the government has organized the manufacturing sector in a country like South Korea is phenomenal. So I think this tie back to the balance of trade, the loss of jobs, and the weakness in the manufacturing sector is really important. And I, um, Rob and Stephen, have laid that out in a way I haven't seen it done before, so I really thank them for that. As we get into a public policy debate on manufacturing, I think there are lots of misnomers about what manufacturing is today. It really isn't well understood by the general public. It's a lot less vertical integration than the companies we think about from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. It's much more value chain relationships, so there are huge value chains between companies and and the way in which we set a strategy needs to recognize these value chains and, and how they interact. In particular, the role of small and mid-sized firms has grown remarkably in the last 20 years. Um, all that corporate R&D that was once done in the very large GEs and GMs has been spread out across a wide variety of companies, and, and the strategy needs to reflect that. Automation really, in the last 20 years, has changed manufacturing. Uh, the number of unskilled jobs that are out there has diminished because of automation. But in turn, the number of skilled manufacturing jobs has leapt. So the, uh, the super tech that exists in manufacturing is the most valuable person today. And that's where the biggest shortage is. The other part of manufacturing that may not be understood today is the relationship between product development and manufacturing. So if one starts with innovation and invention and moves into product definition and product development and eventually into manufacturing and later into the customer feedback loop, um, these things all go together. And if you remove something like manufacturing by offshoring it, you remove one of the big feedback mechanisms that lets you do product innovation, lets you do advanced product development, it lets you stay at the top of the game in a particular segment. So if you take manufacturing offshore it, it's, some would dismiss that as being not relevant, but it's in fact a part of a process. And when you remove that part of the process, you, you've decimated the feedback mechanisms that allow you to do product development and allow you to take innovation all the way to manufactured products. So this is the gap that exists. We're really very good at innovation in many respects. We're pretty good at, in, at manufacturing, but there are these huge gaps between the two. And part of the reason for the gap is the offshoring of the manufacturing. Um, so manufacturing knowledge is, is, is really critical. Things like how to lean manufacture a product or how to, how to take what you learn on the factory floor feed it back into the engineering process and evolve the product is, is critical. Um, so as I said, the part of this is education and there's a lot written and talked about STEM and as a small manufacturer, I don't have any trouble finding engineers. I can find engineers from the bachelor's to the PhD level who are really well qualified. I can find lots of unskilled workers. What I can't find are the people in the middle. All the people who would in the 1940s or 50s have come out of World War II and the GI Bill, learned a trade, and then gone back into a manufacturing sector. Those people don't exist. So our manufacturing sector is filled with 50-year-old white men, right, who are, who are going to retire in five or ten years, and there's no generation set to replace them. And it's, so it's more than just STEM. So there's an awful lot of outreach needed to high schools, to junior high schools, to change the stigma of manufacturing in America. 
if you're a parent of a 14-year-old, the last thing you're going to do right today is tell your child to go into manufacturing. You're going to say, go get an engineering or a law degree. And yet, I have people in our shop factory who are making over $100,000 a year and have risen through the ranks faster than any engineer would. And that career needs to be understood by the general public and it needs to be recognized as valuable. Um, next topic was tech transfer. Um, we have uh, laws on the military side and in the Department of Commerce side that regulate tech transfer. And these are, in my opinion, largely antiquated. Um, the large firms avoid those laws by moving offshore. They basically, if they're going to do a battery and R&D program that's restricted by tech transfer, they go to Canada and do the R&D in Canada so they don't have that trade barrier, that tech transfer barrier. Um, small and mid-sized firms don't have that advantage, but the other piece of the foreign trade barriers is, are that foreign partners, if I go to Hyundai and I say, well, I've got to get a license to, to talk to you about hydrofoil crew boats, right? Um, they said, well, you know, maybe I'd rather go talk to the Italians. They don't need a license. So, um, so the fences impede tech transfer in both directions. And in the next generation, we're going to be importing technology from China. It's, it's already upon us. So we need to think carefully about the fences we put up and what role they play in the, um, in the international trade business. Next topic is manufacturing technology. The great leaps in, in our industrial ages have come with changes in manufacturing technology. Changes in the CNC machine tool business, the Henry Ford's uh, factory line, the recent changes in micro machining <coughs> that have come, that have enabled a lot of things in the healthcare industry to change. Um, thin film deposition, which um, you know, came out of transistor work and you know, all these things. So part of a national strategy needs to be to understand and promote what the next generation of manufacturing change is going to be. So whether it's the NIST extreme manufacturing looks, whether it's the innovation things that are going on in the Manufacturing Extension Partnership to try to spur the relationship between small business innovation research and manufacturing and what the supply base is doing. Things like biological manufacturing may well be the next wave of, of big change that comes. How do we grow things that are, that are actually parts for an automobile? And so if you're going to look forward, not just back, you've really got to embrace the changes that are coming in manufacturing and, and think of manufacturing as a much broader sector than you have in the past. A um, couple more here. Um, Long-term investments. Uh, these, you know, I think Rob and Stephen talked to this a little bit, but the R&D tax credits, they're important, but they're fundamentally a short-term investment strategy in some ways. And what we've got to do with the tax structure is really look at the long term. I mean, these are decade-long investment strategies that you need. And in the current financial structure in the U.S., we're not very good at decade-long investment strategies. We're, we're much better at one- or two-year strategies. So one of the real big roles for the federal government is, is changing what Wall Street would normally do into what Wall Street should do for the health of the country. And so... In my opinion, these public-private partnerships play a big role in that. Things like the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, which have these 60 centers that reflect the local needs of manufacturers that vary with region uh, and can provide that feedback into a federal system, become the tools with which you can bring about change. And how we use those tools becomes the subject of what the investment strategy should be. And um, I guess with that, I would wrap up and say I, I really think this report is really timely. Uh, coming out of the recession, there's a real recognition of some factors that would have been hard to discuss a few years ago. And um, I'd certainly embrace the recommendation. Great. Thank you, Mark. Rob? Well, thank you, uh, Rob and Stefan, for uh, inviting me and for putting together this uh, report. Uh, uh, I uh, think it is very timely and it's going to help uh, inform our uh, discussions at the Department of Commerce. And I quickly want to recognize uh, Bob Bell, my friend from AFL-CIO, who's uh, done, uh, dedicated a lot of his life to working on these issues. I guess I have um, 
several comments. One, the case for a national manufacturing strategy, it's important that we put it in historical context. Uh, Ron Bloom, uh, who's the president's manufacturing uh, senior advisor, did a report, the strategic importance of manufacturing, and it starts out with Alexander Hamilton. And, uh, you know, you if you look at a lot of what that report, which I recommend to you, which Alexander Hamilton talked about uh, in uh, 1790, which then influenced Henry Clay and Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and then you go and you look at Calvin Coolidge, who was the, this apostle for limited government and what he did with the Commerce Department under Herbert Hoover uh, with the Aeronautics Division, funding a lot of our aerospace industry. And you go up through Ronald Reagan uh, with Semitech and what he did uh, in funding our semiconductor industry, you see a long bipartisan tradition uh, in America of a strong national manufacturing strategy and, and uh, investment in manufacturing. So I think this report is in line with that. And I, you know, there's, I think it's important, and I studied economics at University of Chicago, but it's important to understand when, when some of the pe people, and I'm not going to name names, are quoting Ayn Rand and, and uh, Frederick Hayek as explicit uh, influences on their thinking, how radical and different that is from American history and our American economic tradition. And Alexander Hamilton in this report talks about, you know, we want free markets and we want uh, markets relatively unimpeded by government, but any prudent statesman is going to believe in strategic investments and and encourage uh, and encouraging manufacturing. That strategic framework, I think, is what informs uh, the president's policies uh, for a national uh, innovation strategy in which this report is consistent with. I'm very glad that you brought up the, the uh, exports and the trade deficit because I think there's many people just don't know that. I, I uh, see this on a daily basis. Almost 60% of the clients we work with uh, who export are manufacturers. And I was on a panel a couple months ago with uh, Michael Porter, who's this uh, very well-known professor at uh, Harvard Business School, who was saying, well, why don't you focus on service exports? We have a compares comparative advantage in service exports over manufacturing exports. And that may be true. There may be a comparative advantage. And there's no reason we can't do both. There's no reason that we can't reach out to service exports. But as Stefan, your paper points out, we're just not going to balance our trade deficit selling movies and software, I mean, it's just anyone who looks at the numbers, and it's just not going to work. So if we want to reduce our trade deficit, we have to focus on manufacturing, and uh, it's going to be a key component to achieving the president's goal. There, there's only so much we can do in doubling exports by improving export promotion services, uh, which is what my agency is, is tasked with doing. And the president's been terrific on, on calling for doubling exports. Exports are up about 18% talking about more export finance uh, loans, talking about more aggressive advocacy. You see you know, other countries' presidents going all over the place advocating for their companies. We don't do the same, uh, or traditionally haven't, so the president's instructed <coughs> anyone who goes overseas, make sure you're advocating for American manufacturing interests. There's only so much, though, export promotion is going to do. We first, we also need the manufacturing base to be able to, to sell things. So critical to doubling uh, exports over the, the next five years in a long-term export strategy, I think, is going to be uh, having recommendations like you propose, and I'm looking forward to your future reports, about strengthening, a, uh, strengthening our, what we do produce. One of the uh, privileges in my job is that I do go, get to go around and uh, see extraordinary success stories of manufacturing. And I, I think your comments and your uh, criticisms of the method methodology of how we measure stuff is, is directly on point. And, but I think we also, there's a fine balance uh, because we have to, so many Americans think all of our manufacturing has just gone offshore, that, that we don't make anything any, here anymore. And I think it's important that we start out uh, with reminding people, you know, we do make uh, a lot of the world's things still. The trend lines aren't good, but that we tell the stories, uh, and I'll tell you one, if you know, I was up in uh, New Hampshire, and uh, they, they're still the largest uh, manufacturer of fire suits up there in Pittsfield, which employs about globe manufacturing, employs about 10% of the uh, population in that town. And after 9-11, uh, the uh, Pentagon called 
Glow Manufacturing and said, you know, every other fire, uh, our, all our uh, firemen are putting out the fire in the Pentagon. Their suits aren't allowing them to stay uh, through the night. But your suits, because they were innovative and because of uh, some things they had to, to keep out pathogens, are allowing people, our firefighters, to fight the, the, this fire. And so um, the small manufacturer, about 300 people in town, got together. They got a mercy flight, uh, the only flight to go and deliver these uh, suits to the Pentagon. The whole town got together, put these in boxes, and in, in the next day they were there, and, and these firefighters ended up saving uh, using these fire suits to save the Pentagon. My sense is the more of these stories that we can tell about uh, the innovation, the creativity, the entrepreneurship uh, that our manufacturers have, the better. Because the problem, in my judgment, isn't the manufacturers. We have a huge advantage. We're a democratic country. We've got a democratic culture even in the business world. We value each of our employees to be innovative. Our problem is more in the policy. So I think what we have to do, in my judgment, is tell the story of the, the success of American manufacturing, the competitive advantages our American manufacturers have, and then say, you know, they're, it's, a, it's a miracle that they're doing as well as they are given the rigged system against them. How can we uh, fix some of the policies? Uh, but, you know, it's still a, a vibrant sector in this, in this country. And my final point is, of course, uh, I think uh, ma manufacturing is, is critical to our own national security and our own uh, economy, but as, as Rob and I have talked about this, I also think it's ultimately uh, good for the world. It's not just a uh, protectionist or mercantilist argument. Uh, one, if you go overseas, most people still want American products. It's uh, that you're depriving people around the world by rigging the system of high medical devices, but life-saving technology, the best products. So you're actually hurting consumer welfare by depriving people of uh, access to the best technology. And so other nations, which in my judgment often privilege their elites, are doing so at the, at the expense not just of American workers, but also of their own, uh, own consumers. And I think uh, as we talk about uh, the importance of American manufacturing, uh, we should keep in mind the, the extraordinary breathtaking technology and advantages uh, that has been America's gift to the world, and why increasing American exports uh, will help our economy, but also uh, ultimately lift the standard of living uh, elsewhere. Great. Thank you. Um, Ro, I just got to say, you must be a grave disappointment to your faculty at University of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, every day, they're like, where did we go wrong? Did you not like guess the main course we taught there? So, uh, a testament to you that you were able to go through that and have enlightened views. So, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by by thanking um, ITF for the invitation, the opportunity to spend some time with you this morning. Knowing the media is in the room, I should just stop there and just say I agree um, to avoid uh, getting myself into trouble. Um, but I'm unfortunately not that smart. Um, so let me, I guess, begin by saying, um, you know, it's, again, I'm going to echo much of what was said. We are facing a tremendous challenge, but there is an opportunity here. The challenge is we grow up, or we get up every morning, manufacturers across the country, and face an 18% hole, competitive hole with their international competition. So a widget maker in Topeka, a metal bender in Ohio, a food processor in, in, in California, wakes up and, and it's an 18% hole that they're facing. And that's a hole that was not created, you know, by, you know, kind of market forces. It, and not done by, um, you know, challenges that have been presented by, by Beijing or by Brussels. It's policies out of Washington that have made that 18% hole for that manufacturer. Now, that does not include uh, labor costs. So a, a study that, that was done by, by MAPI actually found if you take labor costs out, that 18% exists. So it's regulatory costs, it's, it's health care costs, it's tort costs. It, it's the, 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 the legal and, and, and regulatory environment in which we've created for manufacturers to compete in this, in this country is an 18% disadvantage. So we came in... Um, Last year, and again, uh, it just kind of took the next step with which where I think ITF is going, and, and this document is in the back. We came in with a manufacturing strategy, and we basically laid out what we think is an answer to some of the challenges. And, and what we did is, is take our the policy positions of our 12,000 members and really try to condense those into top-line goals. 
and goals that I think are, are bipartisan in nature. No one's really, and, and again, as I spend time on the Hill and with the administration, I haven't heard anyone say you're wrong. So the goals, and, and, and again, this may be a first, so if you tell me I'm wrong, please do. Um, um, but the goals that we're, we that are laid out here and the policies that support it are, are, are really centered on three central tenets. The first is make the United States the best place in the world to headquarter a company, make the United States the best place in the world to do the bulk of your R&D, make the United States the best place in the world to be a manufacturing platform, not only for the North American market, but for the rest of the world. Now, again, fairly easy, you know, who's going to say I'm against making the United States the best place in the world to manufacture? I mean, you know, it's, but so then you start kind of scratching the surface and getting into some more controversial stuff. And, and unfortunately, I may have to touch on those and, and I um, preemptively apologize. Um, um, but some of the things that, that we've been finding over the last two, three years, the manufacturing strategy, the manufacturing community, the jobs they represented has had a tremendous amount of, of interest from the Hill and from, from policymakers. People are coming to us consistently and saying, how can we help? Come testify before this committee. Come you know, serve on the you know, Secretary of Commerce's Manufacturing Advisory Council. Come serve on the Jobs and Competitiveness Council with, with, with Jeff Emmel. Get involved with crafting policies that are going to turn things around. That's been great. Because again, unfortunately, we're facing a situation since since November of 2008 where we've lost 2.2 million manufacturing jobs. Manufacturing is beginning to turn. We have seen manufacturing jobs come back online, but we're still over 2 million manufacturing jobs in the hole since the beginning of the recession and, and really the kind of the, the real deep recession starting in, in November, December 2008. So while there's progress, we're still 2 million jobs in the hole. And if you're a policymaker in Washington, if you're a member of Congress, you know, going back to your district, you're crossing your fingers you have an average district. You're crossing your fingers that you go back to a district where 9% unemployment is the average. In a lot of manufacturing heavy districts, that number is in reality 15, 17, 18%. If you include those people that are not actively looking for work, that number can cross 20%. So you end up with, as a policymaker, you're going back into a political environment in which you've got 15 to 20% unemployment. Nearly one in five of your, of your working, you know, working age constituents are out of work. So there's been a lot of appetite for, hey, how can we turn things around? Again, we're hopeful that, that the manufacturing strategy that, that we've laid out, the, the path that you guys are going down, the appetite in Washington is going to turn into some real clear, positive growth policies, a jobs agenda, a growth agenda, a competitiveness agenda. Turn the big picture of thinking of a strategy into specific concrete actions that are going to make that 18% lower. Make it competitive. Hey, how about an idea? Why don't we have a, a policy in Washington that we make American manufacturers more competitive than the rest of our international competition? You know, where that's the goal. But unfortunately, you know, again, the conversation, and again, I'll just I'll leave here. The conversation for the last several months has been a conversation about tax increases on small and medium-sized businesses, about higher energy costs, about higher health care costs, where, again, we're making that 18%, unfortunately, look more dire than it is looking more, you know, it's more positive in the, in the coming months and years. And to the point uh, that was raised, you know, uh, manufacturers uh, manufacturers want to stay here if they can, but they're thinking about building a facility or expanding an existing facility. They're in Ohio. Tennis, this government of Tennessee comes knocking on their door. The government of Georgia comes knocking on their door. Government of California comes knocking on the door and saying, "This is what we can do for you. This is what we can do on tax incentives. This is what we can do on maybe a, a road bypass." Meanwhile, here comes the Prime Minister, the President of Poland, of Ireland, of Singapore coming in saying, you're facing a 35% corporate tax rate, the highest in the world. This is what we'll do for you. In the best case scenario, you're facing the 17th, R the 17th best R&D tax credit in the world. When we have it in place, which unfortunately we don't have it in place very often, but when it is in place, it's the 17th best in the world. Foreign governments are coming to manufacturers saying, Here's what I'll do for you on, on R&D. Here's what I'll do for you on individual rates. Here's what I'll do for you on energy policy. Here's what I'll do for you on regulatory policy. So you end up in an environment where you've got the governor of Ohio, the governor of California, the governor of Georgia at the table saying to a manufacturer, this is what we want to do to make sure that you say United States, that you come, you build your manufacturer in Georgia, you build it in Ohio, you build it in California. They can offer a package that, that doesn't compare to what, unfortunately, is being offered internationally. We've got to change things and make sure that our government, that there's a seat at the table for the federal government to come in and say, look, we want to be helpful. We want to be a partner. We want to make sure when you think about where you want to grow your competitiveness and where you think you want to grow jobs and, and build capacity, you make the decision to build the United States. So with that, I'll, 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 I'll end there. Great. 
I don't think that was <clears throat> that wasn't too controversial. Thank you. <laughs> I hope not. We'll see. <laughs> right. Uh, so we have about uh, a little more than 20 minutes left. Uh, so if folks have questions, uh, you want to just uh, raise your hand, then I'll call in order. And if you can identify yourself right here, and then Bob. Um, I'm Betsy Wertheim with the Naval Post, <coughs> Naval Post Graduate School. But when I, I spent 13 years at IBM, and a lot of that was focused on manufacturing. But I'm a social anthropologist. And so my question is, how are you going to change the attitudes of the American voter? I mean, I, I'm old, so I watch television and I don't do tweets, but most of the conversation is about whether Bar Barack Obama was born in the United States or the hair. How do you make these stories, which I think are so incredibly exciting, and there's no question that there's drama there, that you get it into the nightly news. That's the first point. The second is. Why don't, why don't we just do one? Because we. Yeah, well, I, want, I want to ask about simple stories so the public can understand it. And this is not a simple story. Okay. So. Why don't we go to row? Why don't you do? Why don't you see if you can take that? How do you make this compelling in in politics? Well, one, I think, if you look at some of the polling, uh, ma having a manufacturing strategy and having a national manufacturing as a priority polls very, very high, and it, it's one of the top. Or one or two priorities that people identify uh, when uh, asked by, by pollsters about uh, what their, their concerns are. So I think the American public is probably more engaged uh, than, than we give them credit for. The other thing I would say is, you know, there's a great thing in this country that uh, uh, when, when there's a crisis, uh, you, you should never underestimate uh, our, our ability. And a lot of times I think people can be apathetic disengaged but you know when there's a when there was world war ii or when there was the threat of the soviet union overtaking us uh, and i'll just you know the, in the there was paul samuelson i think economist in 1950 wrote this textbook saying given current growth rates uh the soviet union would overtake our economy by 1985 turned out to be wrong and then you know, if you look at the cover pages of uh, every business review article in the 1980s, it was the U.S. won the, the Cold War, but Germany and Japan are going to be the dominant economies. It turned out to be wrong. So I think when there is a crisis, and I think Rob and Stefan uh, have done a great job in alerting us to us, then I think we will see that mobilized engagement. And uh, it, the criticism is good. That's part of a healthy democracy that then mobilizes and awakens our, our public. But I would, I would never underestimate our ability to, to uh, get engaged. Great. Bob? Uh, Bob Baugh, the Executive Director of the Industrial Union Council at the AFL-CIO. Uh, Rob, I want to thank you and Steve um, for this paper. It is really an important contribution, uh, I think, that actually clarified issues we've been talking about for years, about policymakers even making decisions on bad information about the state of American manufacturing. Because we've been in the public forums and, and arguing the ideologues uh, that you refer to, Bro, about this stuff, uh, that say, oh, it's just productivity and technology uh, that's actually taken away those jobs. It doesn't have anything to do with trade. It doesn't have anything to do with manufacturing policy. In fact, it has everything to do with those, those things, and I think you documented much of this in your paper, and I think it's a welcome contribution. Let me uh, ask the, the tough question here. I think you're, the four T's you point out, I would agree with completely about parts of a strategy for our nation the need for a national manufacturing strategy. And what's striking to me when we look at all the rest of the world, with the, a couple of exceptions you pointed out, the UK in particular, is all those countries that we compete with really do have a national strategy. They actually have a national interest. And that national interest says, we want manufacturing jobs because it's good for jobs and income in our economy and our future. Ours says, oh, it's better because we can get cheaper goods. We don't have a philosophy, and it's driven by an ideology. And frankly, the four T's we're talking about here, what frightens me is that we don't have a national interest. We need to define one to have a national strategy. Yet, in fact, we are in conflict with major members of NAM over some of these things because as international corporations and as financial institutions, they drive other policies that say, don't interfere, don't have a national plan. Um, we're playing football. I mean, I think that's a real issue that we have to come to grips with in this country about the divergence between our national manufacturing organizations and the national interest and how they do business. Uh, well, I'm not going to let Eric respond to that one because that's. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. 
Go ahead. And you, we, uh, you well, no, I no, I, I I hope you would let me. Um, no, um, I you know again, I'm not in a position where I, I should, in a public forum, get into a detailed conversation about where you are with individual member companies. Let me answer it in a broad way. From a manufacturer's perspective, from the community perspective, our belief is there does need to be a strategy. Our belief it needs that has very specific goals that have very specific metrics. And, and if the Jobs and Competitiveness Council comes out and if the, the compete study that you mentioned comes in with a report in January next year, our hope is that it turns into action, that there's a specific policies that are put in place that gives Congress the ability to vote up or down. Are you for, are you for, uh, you know, coal? Are you, where are you on clean coal technology? Where are you on cap and trade? Where are you on health care costs? Where are you on tick off the list of things that are driving the competitiveness and making American manufacturing less competitive? And have an up or down vote on it. Because right now, unfortunately, the conversation is there's this study, there's our study, there's a thousand studies out there. There's a thousand groups out there talking about the need to do something about manufacturing. It's great. It's great that the conversation is happening. In this environment, I think there is a crisis right now. You know, we, we've lost 2.2 million fa manufacturing jobs in the last two years. If that's not a crisis, I don't know what is. So if we're ever going to do something, now's the time to do something. Unfortunately, we're three and a half months into this Congress, and the conversation's not about jobs and competitiveness. The conversation, neither body is going to the floor on a weekly basis saying, here's our agenda to make America more competitive. Here's our agenda to change the direction of jobs in this country. Here's our agenda to grow manufacturing jobs in this country. That's not what's coming out of Washington. Until that changes, we're going to end up in this debate of, you know, let's have a conversation about the problem, but we're not having a conversation about the solution. We need to have a conversation about the solution. Um, why don't we go right, right here? Uh, okay, my name is John Tucker, National Academy of Public Administration. It's more of comments, so I'll make it brief. Um, I, the underlying issues of the discussion of manufa national manufacturing strategy that really resonated with me were the coordination, failure, and uncertainty. It, and you, know, you have companies there who are have to go it alone. They're not part of an ecosystem. Same with individuals deciding on what to do when they go into school and what to get trained in. And I think it's, uh, you know, the company there investing in battery technology without the support of that ecosystem, do I cut a deal, go abroad, or stay here? And without that overarching framework, it's a very difficult decision to make. Again, with uh, somewhat, you've got all those 50-year-old uh, white men looking to retire soon. I mean, it's not just the image of manufacturing. It's the incentives and the prospect. I mean, even high tech is bleeding. So am I, if I'm going to MIT, am I going to go into one of these cutting edge fields or am I going to go become a consultant and you know, make my money outsourcing? The incentives are very skewed. So th th that's, I'll leave it at that. Mark, do you want to respond and use the mic? Um, it's a, it's a, a couple things have happened recently that give me some hope that maybe there's recognition of that problem. One is this trend toward clustering where you know, and particularly in medical fields, we've we've really clustered industries to try to build the infrastructure that, uh, even without government support, gives you that reinforcement mechanism. There's also a Brookings Institute report out on urban manufacturing, which uh, traces the the decline in in or the increase in poverty in urban areas with the decline in manufacturing base within those urban areas. So, um, I think there are lots of policy possibilities here. To sort of regain the the things that you're talking to, which is, I guess, back to an earlier question, is is also the impression of the public on what a manufacturing job is and why you would want your child to enter that profession, and um, so probably news stories and clusters and and things that happen locally but bubble up to a national level are part of the conversation that's going to adjudicate these differences if, if we get to a strategic. Yeah, just to finish your point, you know, I, think what, I think what you hit on is an important one because if you believe that individual actors make rational decisions absent other decisions that, in, that individual actors make, that, there, that there's no sort of network effect, then you maximize welfare. And in this case, it's not the case because people make individual decisions based upon what they think the system is doing and their individual systems, their individual decisions, if they're not the right decisions, lead the system uh, subperformance, whether it's a company deciding where to build the battery or whether it's a worker deciding what they're going to go into. So that's the, really, at the end of the day, the key argument why you have to have a policy to drive the health of the ecosystem because then it becomes self reinforcing. Uh, let me go back in the very back there. Uh, Dennis Chamis with the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, it seems to me that 
this has been an excellent presentation, by the way, and uh, uh, a lot of good analysis of where the problems are. And uh, I guess the only comment that I would add to it is the problems of manufacturing strike me as being a part of the problems of the United States. Uh, I think we're going to face the same problems in some of the service areas. Uh, manufacturing, when lost, is hard to regain. But by the same token, a lot of service uh, service industries uh, have a much less, uh, much smaller barrier to entry. Uh, so, for example, if you're developing a financial product or a banking service, there's no reason why the Germans, the Japanese, or many others couldn't do the same thing uh, very, very carefully, very uh, uh, quickly, rather. Uh, I was, I was intrigued by some of the comments from the end of the table here, but how do we make the U.S. a more attractive place uh, for manufacturing, which I agree with entirely. That is a key question. The question, though, that follows is how do you do that without uh, instigating a race to the bottom? In some, case, in some ways, it would be very easy to eliminate some of the environmental laws, uh, eliminate some of the labor protections, uh, eliminate the requirements for health care, uh, and you immediately change the cost structure dramatically. Uh, that's not going to help. So that's what makes the, uh, the issue so important and the solution so difficult, because we don't want to fundamentally change what the country is all about, uh, yet the differential still exists. So that's people I, and, and you raised, and, and, and you nudge me to um, make clear that study that 18% is based on competition with our major international trading partners. This is France, Germany, Britain, South Korea, Japan. So that 18%, it's not a conversation of, the, you know, we as a manufacturing community believe that we should, you know, race to the bottom and, and lower health care standards, lower environmental standards, lower labor standards. That's not the answer. The answer is, look, we in the manufacturing sector are paying 24% more to our employees than any other sector in the economy. We're committed to the welfare of our employees. We're committed to, as good corporate citizens, to, to good, solid health care good solid labor practices, good solid environmental practices. The conversation, that 18%, is the French and Germans have policies that make them more competitive than we do. It's not a conversation between the United States and unnamed third world country. I don't want to impugn anyone. But you know, we're not, we're, not, I don't, we're not coming to the conversation saying we need to be a third world country in this environment. What we're saying is our major international trading partners, the ones that I think we want to compete with and the ones that we are competing with, they're 18 percent in a better position than we are. There's a uh, an excellent article by uh, Dan Luria called uh, "High Road High Road Manufacturing," where he makes the the argument that that uh, companies where which have healthy work environments, which have healthy labor standards, uh, which uh, invest in their employees, uh, have such substantial productivity gains, innovation gains that it is a it, it's a competitive advantage and we see so the, there there is a, a story of American manufacturing it, it's true there is a, a productivity advantage over China productivity over J advantage over Japan and Germany that, that we should uh, take as a baseline then the question is okay given that we're doing a lot of stuff right what is it that we need to do better and there uh, I think Rob and, and Steve's policy recommendations of having a, a, a strong and and what the president has has proposed in, t in terms of uh, uh, for example, the investment tax credit, where that was a bipartisan proposal. There was a temporary tax credit for any manufacturer that wanted to invest in, in capital equipment. And we can talk about what other things that w we need to do, but there are, uh, or making sure that we're enforcing a, a fair trade uh, agreement. So there, there are policy issues that we can take into account uh, to make us more competitive, but I don't think we need to uh, undermine. Uh, the labor environmental standards that often give us this productivity advantage in the first place. Steve, Steve Johnson, somehow retired working on a book. <clears throat> I spent a couple of years uh, working for Cummins Engine Company at the Jamestown Engine Plant some years back. And I think it would be interesting, Rob, if you would just poll the room and see how many people in this room have actual factory experience. I've been in a factory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody ever? worked at a factory or a manufacturer. Oh, a good group, good. Higher than the national average. All right, that's good. Was that your point? Yeah, yeah that, was the, that was the point. Higher than the national average, but still well under half. No, I mean, look, at the end of the day, I really think that's Washington's problem, is, is, is if we had another, like, 75 Marx companies in, in, in the Washington region, 
we'd see manufacturing every day. I mean, I think most people are like, manufacturing? What is that? Doesn't everybody work in an office? And, you know, you go to a place like Los Angeles or a place like Boston or a place like Detroit where they're actually making things, and it just becomes much more part of the dynamic and people understand it. So maybe what we could do is the president's policy could be to import manufacturers to Maryland and Virginia. That, would be our, that should be our strategy. So uh, in the back there. Um, that's Brian over here with the Apollo Alliance, and uh, we're actually trying to do some of that of getting some of the policymakers in touch with some of the manufacturers that are out there, doing a series of events with some uh, Secretary of Transportation, Deputy Secretary of Secretary Transportation, to bring them around to actually see some manufacturing done. Um, we need also transport up in Rochester, uh, United Streetcar as well, um, out in Portland. But my main question here is um, what Eric brought up. In talking to some of the manufacturers we work with on a regular basis, we hear these stories, and we hear from policymakers as well. Of there's someone from another another country coming in, offering putting a better offer on the table for someone to relocate. And I'm wondering if there's a relationship between the point Eric brought up and what you were talking about, Robert, in terms of enforcing our actual trade policies or WTO policies that are on the books, and what relationship might exist between some of those offers being made and what's in in the bounds and outside the bounds of and well, I think one of the most confusing areas today in trade policy is what's a subsidy and what's a legitimate investment in your ecosystem. And I think the WTO was completely confused about that. I think they're essentially uh, purists. Uh, they're, they're almost ideologues that any kind of, even look at what the European Commission is doing. Uh, on, on what is a subsidy and what isn't. I mean, they are actually saying in Europe that certain kinds of R&D tax credits are a subsidy. I, I just find this bizarre. So I guess I'd put in the notion that, you know, at the end of the day, we're not going to be able to stop countries from putting incentive deals on the table. Uh, you know, and, and what we really, where we really need to be drawing the line, I would argue, is is much more unfair trade practices. So it's, it's one thing to sort of incense them. It's, the launch aid to me is, is, is sort of, that's, that goes on the other side of that. Uh, stealing intellectual property, <coughs> currency manipulation, standards manipulation, uh, forced technology transfer. So if you want to access the Chinese market, in many, many cases, you have to give them technology. These are, to me, the egregious practices. And I just wouldn't get into fights over these kinds of other policies around that at the end of the day, you know, probably are, are zero sum or positive sum as opposed to these other negative sum strategies. I would just add, I. Um, you're not going to be able to, to I think you're right, to, to prevent a, a foreign government to come in with an offer. My hope is that we can get policies in this country when a manufacturer makes, it, it, hears that offer, they're saying, look, I, I've got a, I, it makes no sense for me from an economic perspective to make the jump to a foreign country. The environment is here here is so great for, for manufacturing that the policies are in place. I'm able to you know earn a, a return on my capital. My workers are, are great workers. There's, there's a tremendous amount of downsides involved in, in making the transition from a domestic manufacturer to international location. The incentive packages are such right now that they're willing to take on that downside in some situations. We've got to make it an environment here where that, you know, that foreign government comes knocking on the door and it's a complete non-starter. It's, you know, it's, you know, thanks for coming by, have a nice day. I'm thrilled here. My health care costs are great. There's a great energy policy in place. The regulatory envir environment is sound. You know, again, it, it, the underlying policies are where they sh where, where they should be. Great. Uh, right back here. Yeah, my name is George Cooper. I'm currently with an organization called the. Uh, it does. <laughs> what, what the hell is my name? In? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've been in the manufacturing policy world for a long time, and uh, what you've come up with in the way of a report, I look forward to reading what you presented. Uh, has the elements of good policy. The question becomes one of how does that good policy get set in this uh, cultural divide that we currently call our country. Uh, we, the the, the uh, part of our economy that has been most successful has been the finance community who has made sure that policy in our nation is supportive of their interests and our interests. The question becomes one of how do you get more Mark Rices coming up forward and articulating the demand function for that policy out of the manufacturing community. Because the manufacturers have left it to NAM. Um, NAM has struggled mightily to try to reflect a consensus among manufacturers, which is very difficult to achieve to begin with. But manufacturers themselves do not understand the impact of policy on their operations sufficiently to mobilize. 
So the question becomes one of how do you make that happen? Uh, give them all hedge fund salaries. <laughs> <laughs> That'll start. <laughs> Excess money allows you to buy a lot of influence. Uh, I'm only teasing a bit, but uh, I don't know, Mark, you want to respond to that? Let's see. I, I, um, I also have a role in the MEP as the National Advisory Board Chair. And what I really have, the reason I did that is because I believe these public private partnerships have an instrumental role to play. It, Quite often, we talk past each other, and, and the Mark Rices um, don't, don't have a mechanism for their voice to get through the system. And in turn, the government policy is, is based on, uh, no offense meant here, but economics as opposed to a deeper understanding of a manufacturing sector. So you've got to have the mechanisms for the conversation to exist. I think NAM is one of those, but I think that it... It's, a, it's, a, it's driven by some economics that perhaps are not there in the public-private partnerships. So the models that I'm interested in are the things which force that communication at the grassroots level, the local level, where if you're in Detroit, the conversation is about automobiles or something else, and if you're in Berkeley, it's about something else. And, and those bubble up through some sort of public policy system so that someone sitting in row shoes has access to the to the thousand things as opposed to um, a couple of voices. I just briefly say, I think the one advantage, if you look at the uh, Super Bowl ad that Chrysler did with uh, Detroit making stuff and it got five million YouTube hits, I mean, I think there's a, a hunger out there, especially after the financial crisis, uh, for the country to get back to basics. And it's a very... You know, you go to kindergarten kids, or they, they don't get excited about stockbrokers or lawyers coming there. They get excited about people who are making things. And I think, uh, so my sense has been as I've traveled the country that there is, beyond the manufacturing community, uh, an emerging sense that uh, manufacturing is critical uh, to, to American greatness. And, and I think that's something, just like there are issues of foreign policy that are bipartisan, and when, when they're really national security is that state, we usually tend to come together. If we can frame manufacturing in that same way, that this is something important for the country, I think that's the best hope, rather than just having uh, manufacturers be the advocate. In the last, let me just quickly add, in the last three, four months, we've had 150, 160 members of Congress in manufacturing facilities across the country in their <coughs> districts come to, come home over the weekend, member of Congress, visit the local manufacturing facility. And in those meetings, we'll have anywhere between 20 and 50 additional manufacturers from the district where there's a firsthand conversation. This is what's going on in the manufacturing community. This is what a factory floor looks like. These are the challenges facing manufacturers in your district. It's a conversation about policy. It's a conversation about very localized level. You know, again, it, it, it's a different conversation in Burbank or, or, or California than it is in Detroit. And those conversations are happening. What we're finding is when, when members of Congress come out of those conversations, the challenge is coming back to Washington and doing something with it. And, 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 and that's the fight that I think is the key fight. And we'll continue to have these conversations with members. We'll continue to have these conversations. This we have for the last 10 years. We'll continue for the next 10 years. We're hopeful that we'll break through. Go oh, Andy, and then here, and then here, and then probably have to wrap up. Uh, Andrew Reamer with George Washington University. Question for Will. Uh, when I think about what the Commerce Department's doing around manufacturing, I think of well, lots of different moving parts. ITA has the manufacturing and services unit. There's the commercial service you're with. Um, there's a manufacturing council. There's an advisory council. I think about NIST and MEP, um, Audrey Reamer's work. I think about EDA doing cluster work. I think about Mark Domes doing chief economist doing this uh, innovation, this, uh, this competitiveness assessment. So there's lots of moving parts. Have you worked at the department? You're very familiar. <laughs> he knows more about the department than you do. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I, um, and then, then you have in, in the White House, you have uh, Ron Bloom and you have the uh, innovation group, Bill Wise. So you have all these different moving parts. Describe those how these dots are being connected something that uh, represents some kind of moving towards some kind of coherent manufacturing strategy? Well, it's, it's, it's an excellent question, and, and it's, uh, it's part of the uh, initiative that's, that's public. The president, with Jeff Zients, has uh, uh, tasked uh, a, a look at uh, uh, reorganization and seeing how uh, we can have uh, the agencies of the federal government doing work uh, in a way that's coordinated, 
uh, and and non-duplicative, and and uh, and comes together. And Secretary Locke uh, had an idea for a Commerce Connect, where he uh, wanted to make sure that uh, all these different uh, parts, the MEP program with the commercial service, with uh, industry and services, with EDA, were working together. Uh, and so, for the first time, we have a common software, common sharing of practices. But it is, uh, you know, I mean, to the extent that your point is that there could be. Uh, better, uh, better coordination uh, of, of the agencies. I think that's something that's on the administration's radar uh, that Jeff Science is leading and that Ron, Bro Ron Bloom as the president's senior advisor will have, a, have an impact in. There's certainly a value in, in programmatic coordination, but I'm, I, my question was more pointed toward policy, the kind of strategy that ITF, ITIF is calling for. Is there any kind of effort to organize all these different actors to create some kind of here, strategy or policy around these things. Well, I, well, certainly in in the it, I think Ron Bloom uh, is the lead for the, the the administration on on coming up with the policy for for manufacturing, and and then you have the uh, innovation uh, study being done out of Commerce, and in both of those cases, uh, I know Ron Bloom and the secretary uh, reach out to uh, the different agencies and the the, the policy leads and get their input in, in putting together putting together the policy. We have time for just two more. Yes, sir, right here. Uh, yeah, Ken Hoover from American City Business Journals. Um, Mr. Newhouse mentioned that you know jobs and competitiveness really isn't you know the topic of conversation on Capitol Hill right now. It's it's and then and, and so my question is, you know, with everybody's energy, attention, battle lines all being about budget deficits, how do you break through that? Uh, with this concern for a manufacturing strategy, and what is what relevance does this have to the budget picture? Does it have any connection uh, with dealing with the budget? But the main question is how do you get Congress's attention and get actual policies implemented at a time when all anybody ever wants to address right now on the Hill is the living budget picture? And that's not going to go away anytime soon since it's a decade long or more issue. Well, I think the answer to that is twofold. One of the reasons why people are focused on the budget and, the, and what really is the, is the key thing is the national debt is there's a belief that the, we're passing on a national debt to our, generate, to our children, our next generation, and this is fundamentally unfair. There is fundamentally no difference between passing on our financial debt that the government holds and passing on our national trade debt that is going to be passed on to the next generation as well. At some point in the future, we're going to have to pay both off. And when we do that, we will have a lower standard of living relative to what we had if we didn't have the debt. So when we pay off the trade debt, that means my son is going to have to consume 5% less for about 15 to 20 years than he is producing. And that's no other way to do that because we have to do that. So I think the notion somehow that it, we, we focus on that debt, i.e. the government debt, but we completely ignore this debt that we're passing on to the next generation through the trade debt is, uh, is just missing the whole point. How you deal with that, with that second debt is you have to focus on public investment, whether that's on the tax side, I would call an R&D tax credit a public investment, or lowering the corporate rate, or investing in an investment tax credit for new CapEx, or on the things like MEP, or advanced funding for STEM, or technical training. Look, the reality is we're going to have to probably allocate about $100 billion a year to those kinds of investments, whether it's on the tax side or whether it's on the expenditure side. If we don't do that, the risk is we're going to end up with an economy that fundamentally is not going to be sustainable. It's going to make the debt worse. We did a little study on just the R&D tax credit. It turns out the R&D tax credit, if we bumped it from 14 to 20 percent, actually pays for itself in government revenues. It, because it raises R&D, it raises productivity, that leads to higher government revenues. So if you did that, it actually doesn't cost the government any money. We've seen the same, same studies, for example, on the corporate rate. Uh, nice study by a colleague out of Reed, I can't remember her name right now, uh, Jerry Klausing, done a study that showed that the revenue raising optimal rate, corporate rate is lower than what we have today. So there are a lot of things we can do that actually are going to actually going to raise money at the same time spur public investment. So I think this kind of trade-off, we can't spend any money or invest money in the short run, I think is just fundamentally wrong. You know, how to get that across, I think, is, is a challenge. But again, there's lots of voices now. I mean, everybody at this table, all of these different councils, I, I do see a kind of crescendo, if you will, of voices that are beginning to raise it. So I'm somewhat optimistic it might not happen this year, 
might not even happen next year, but at some point, uh, maybe the next Congress, there'll be a consensus on that. I think there was a... Right. Can I also add very briefly that the only way we'll be able to put our national debt on a sustainable footing uh, cannot come either simply by raising taxes or simply by cutting government expenditures. We have to fundamentally grow the economy and increase employment and increase economic growth, and these types of policies are how you get there. Last question. Uh, thanks for the last question, Scott Bowes, Alliance for American Manufacturing. Uh, actually, the previous question was almost exactly what I was going to ask, so I would just add that uh, more effective enforcement of our trade laws actually doesn't cost a penny. And I, from our perspective, I think that uh, stopping China's currency manipulation is something we could do right now that wouldn't cost a penny, and it would create jobs and would actually increase revenue. So I would just add that. Any reaction to currency and whether or not that might get uh, a vote again in this Congress would be appreciated. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That that would be uh, that would be an effective tool. Um, if we can, uh, if we can take action on that, I agree. I mean, when you think about that, what the Japanese are doing, what the Chinese are doing, and frankly, many Asian countries are are keeping their currency low because you've got this big engine of China. They can't go up because China's not going up. And if we were to have a policy that said we're going to get all of our exporters and we're going to give them a 40 percent tax subsidy on every dollar they export, every unit they export, we're going to, just going to give them come to the treasury and get get your 40 percent check. We would be, other countries would be outraged. This is an unbelievable violation of what any kind of notion of economists have of allocation efficiency in the global marketplace. But that is what currency manipulation fundamentally is. It's a export subsidy. Uh, and the Japanese have done this as well. It's not, it's not just the Chinese. So we, uh, in our view, we, need, we do need to take tougher action on that. But that's not the only part of the trade problem. The, you know, the amount of IP theft uh, that's going on, and IP theft is a big problem in, in digital goods, movies, and software, but it's a big problem in, in, in hardware as well. Uh, so there's a whole set of things we could do. I don't quite agree that it's totally free. I mean, one of the things that we've advocated is that Congress could take a big, easy step by giving USTR, you know, uh, you know, five or ten million dollars more, not a lot of money, but there is, you do need a little few more bodies to actually begin to ramp up our enforcement efforts, but you're right, it's not a big, big investment to be able to do that. Um, well, I want to first of all, I want to thank all of you for, for uh, your attention and patience here, and and, and particularly thank our, our three great respondents. Uh, maybe around if you have questions for them afterwards. So please uh, join me in thanking them and Steve. <laughs>